This is the DTV Digest, the podcast that brings you news and reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema. And now, here's your host, Mike Parkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DTV Digest. I'm your host, Mike Parkin, and joining me tonight are Richard Hawes. Hello, everyone. Stephen Lockeridge. Hello. And Will Bentley. Hello there. We have got a bumper packed episode this week. We're going to kick off with uh, Dolph Lundgren and Scott Atkins in Castle Falls. Then we have a French Moroccan film, Achura. Then we have a teen sci fi movie, Portal Runner. Uh, the Darkness of the Road stars Najara Townsend from The Stylist. Uh, then we got Jason Statham in Wrath of Man. Quite a surprise there. Our short shot this week is Hunted Savage Within, and we're going to round off with our DTV throwback 5050. So, without further ado, let's crack on. Just before we do crack on with the next um, review, uh, just a little heads up that we are joined by Sean Malloy of the Dolph Lundgren podcast, I Must Break This Podcast. Um, Sean will be joining us as a semi-regular contributor from now on, and it was great to have him pop in and help us look at this Dolph Lundgren, Scott Atkins feature. So, on with the show. Our first review, then, is Castle Falls. Mike Wade is a down-on-his-luck MMA fighter who finds himself working on a construction site prepping Castle Heights Hospital for demolition. His luck appears to change when he chances upon three bags, each containing a million dollars. However, not only must he try and sneak the cash out out of the building before its imminent demolition, but there are other interested parties after that loot. Okay, so uh, this is directed by Dolph Lundgren and co-stars Dolph Lundgren alongside Scott Atkins. Um, I'm going to kick this straight over to Sean um, as a Mr. Lundgren expert. Um, what did you make of Castle Falls, Sean? Uh, Lundgren expert, I like that. Yes, I have my PhD in uh, Dolph Lundgren uh, 101. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it, there, there's a lot to say about this one. And I, I don't know um, where you guys want to go with it. Um, I enjoyed it, though. I think it's a uh, it's a fun film. I mean, I think there's a lot, like I said, that we can um, pick apart. Um, I think what for me stands out the most is that, uh, yeah, not only is Dolph Lundgren in front of the camera, but he also stepped behind the camera. This was the first film that he had directed in over 10 years. Um, a lot of people have seemed to have forgotten, uh, but he got the uh, directing bug um, back in 2004 and he pretty much hit the ground running. And the next five films that he did were all ones that he directed. And then once Expendables hit, he uh, he was extremely prolific in everything in, in film, but uh, he, he quit directing. And so you, as a fan, you were kind of wondering like, Okay, he, here's a guy who's shown that he has directing chops. He knows what he's doing behind the camera. Um, I wonder if he's ever going to direct again. And so when I heard about this project, when it was in development, when it was percolating, and uh, then when I found out that he was going to be directing it, it was like, okay, this, this could be cool. Because I think the, the great thing about a guy like Dolph is, um, you know, he... Let, let's face it, I'd say about 95% of his filmography exists in the world of direct-to-video. So here's a guy who is very much aware and is very clear about, you know, what, what a direct-to-video film can, uh, you, you know, what it needs to look good. Okay, you know, he, here's a guy who's worked within this, uh, this world where the budgets are fairly limited and the shooting time is shorter than, you know, a massive blockbuster. So, Here's a guy, he comes in and he knows very clearly, okay, what works and what doesn't work. And so if you look at all of the films that he has not only starred in, but directed, they, in my opinion, stand head and shoulders above anything else that is out there. And I think that is very much uh, uh, on display with this film. Is it, uh, is it a little cheesy in some parts? Sure. Does the, uh, does the low budget uh, kind of stick out and... Uh, I maybe maybe I should say glaringly stand out at times definitely but in the end I think what you have is you have two leads you have Scott Atkins and Dolph who are heavily invested in this film given it their all which in my opinion I think is um kind of uh 
kind of hard to come by nowadays in these direct video films. Absolutely. Sure. Why do you think it was been? Mm. Why do you think it's been so long? Do you think it's just that he was in such demand as you know as as a star that he was just cranking them out and you know take that 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 was what he wanted to focus on, uh, and there or there just simply wasn't a project that w- came his way that you know att- attracted his interest as a director, and and maybe this one is just kind of the one that's come along at the right time. What do you think? What do you think the case is? You know, boy, I, I think I think it's a variety of factors. I think um, with Mr. Lundgren, there was a lot going on um, in his personal life after Expendables. Um, I know he had uh, gotten a divorce. I know he had moved back to Los Angeles. And, you know, I mean, if you look at the direct-to-video market from the late 90s to, uh, to, you know, to 2010 or so, you know, the budgets on these things have shrank considerably. So a film like uh, The Defender, which he did, which is, was his directorial debut, um, The Mechanic, um, even something like Missionary Man. I mean, those are all films that were filmed overseas, I believe, uh, in Europe. And then here he is, he moves to Los Angeles where he can be closer to a lot of these independent films. You know, Los Angeles is the epicenter for a lot of these films. And I think because the budgets had shrank so much, I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think he realized, you know what? I'd still like to work and, you know, work hard. But um, if you look at a lot of the films that he had done, I don't know if, uh, I don't want to say he wasn't terribly invested, but I think he kind of saw the writing on the wall and was kind of like, you know what, I'll just be a, uh, a gun for hire in front of the camera. I'm not really fully invested in something like this behind the camera. You can't look, you know, it's funny. You can't look at a project like Shark Lake, or Forgotten, or um, what are some of the other ones that he's done? Uh, any of the ones that he did with uh, Giorgio Serafini and look at that and think, you know, yeah, that those were amazing films that I imagine he uh, really, really, really wanted to do. I think the paycheck was kind of uh, driving a lot of his decisions with those. And I think this, uh, what's interesting about, if I can just interject and talk about something about this film is what I think it, it's kind of, it's very post Creed too. You know, it's it's Dolph ad- doing a, a more dramatic turn. It's not just, uh, a, you know, playing the action hero or anything. He, I mean, the, the whole first part of the movie is leaning into the to the dramatic side, and I thought he he did really well with that. I would agree. I would agree. And you know, what's 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 interesting though about it is, I mean, okay, if you if you compare this film to, uh, well, we'll go to the mechanic for example. I mean, the mechanic. Um, are you guys familiar with that one? Have you guys seen that one? Yeah. Okay, so that particular film that came out in uh, 2000, 2006, I want to say, yeah, 2006, 2007, that was his second directing job. And if you look at that particular film compared to this film, they're, they're both excellent films. And I think uh, Dolph's acting is amazing. I mean, you watch those, these films and it's very clear that he is uh, heavily involved. He's heavily invested in all facets of the production. But if you look at that film compared to uh, Castle Falls, I think it's very evident um, how much the budgets have changed Mm -hmm. and how this particular film is skirting around the, uh, the limitations. I mean, for example, it all takes place in a, uh, uh, a dilapidated uh, abandoned hospital building, um, which is a cool location, but I think from a, um, from a production standpoint, well, it works. It's a set that really doesn't need to be built all the way and they can film everything in that one location and kind of cut production costs. And I think little things like that make it, uh, are, are, are pretty obvious. Yeah, I think what's, what's good is how, you know, we see a lot of films of that type. Uh, let's say Rogue, uh, Rogue Hostage, for example, with Tyrese Gibson uh, and, Ver- and mm. you know, a few others. And they're just so bland looking. And I think what's good about this one is that, yes, it's shot in a cheap location, but it's photographed really well. And it, and it feels, I mean, it's in, and it's in a full look, like a widescreen. It, has, it is playing in some cinemas, uh, not in the UK, unfortunately, but uh, the, it is, it is you know, made for theatrical presentation. And it looks really good, I think. It's yeah. a really sharp looking yeah. film. It's, I mean, we, we watch a lot of low budget sort of action slash horror movies and you know they, they spend a lot of time running up and down the same corridor um you know sort of redress it slightly uh one of the things i did like about this is that there were 
sort of very um, strikingly different locations within the hospital. You know, you've got the ones with all the explosives, you've got the, the sort of smaller rooms upstairs, you've got the uh, the garbage chute, that sort of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was a bit more dynamic than, than, you know, a lot of these films end up being. I mean, you know, that was that Bruce Willis one, uh, Hard to Kill, is it? A hard Kill, yeah. Hard, hard Kill, kill. yeah. <laughs> that, you know, which is all set in a, a a very bland warehouse, you know, with no imagination whatsoever. So, so I was quite impressed with this. You know, there's some good stunt work sort of thrown in as well. You know, people hanging out windows and going down the garbage chute and things. So I love yeah. the bit where they were hiding. You mm. know, they were standing on standing behind the curtains, mm. like right, yeah. <laughs> and then people down at the bottom <laughs> could like see them, and they're like, oh. <laughs> they're like, that's really awkward and then they catch sight of each other i thought that was great and i think a lot of that a lot of that falls in my opinion on on lundgren's shoulders okay because again this is a guy who you know was uh you know he's been in the directed video world shoots since the since the 90s okay and i think he is of the mentality where he's saying okay look if my uh if my name and my face is not only going to be um in front of the camera but it's also going to be behind the camera well i'm going to put forth my best effort and maybe maybe we are working with them um, i think i read the reported budget was maybe one and a half million which isn't a lot and the shooting schedule was maybe 18 19 days something like that well i think he's a guy where he says okay you know what sure maybe we do have some shortcomings in these areas here but let's deliver in i think the areas that are going to make the fans happy and so the action sequences i mean thank god he has uh, scott atkins at his side to kind of to kind of help in a lot of these scenes but um I think it, uh, c- considering what was going on in the, uh, cause we haven't talked about it, but this film was also uh, shot during uh, COVID. And yep. so, you know, the, the health protocols and everything that they, had, that they had to adhere to. The fact that this film even um, got to completion looking as polished as it did is, uh, is pretty remarkable. Steve, yeah. um, I'm gonna throw this over to you. Uh, what did you make of uh, Castle Falls? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. Um, like you say, it's a bit nice twist with the, um, you know, the inmates in the prison and he's the prison guard. And like you're saying, I thought Dolph Lundgren was actually really, really good in the beginning half of the movie where it is more of a acting bombs rather than just, you know, your typical action type of thing. Like the storyline of his daughter, I thought it was really, really quite affecting. I thought it was really good. Uh, again, Scott Atkins is, you know, Scott Atkins, but I like the fact that he was actually able to use his normal accent mm. and, you know, they kind of work that into the film as well. Uh, the baddies were a little bit over the top, but apart from that, I thought it was really good. I especially liked the bit where the, um, the bad guy's girlfriend was killed. Mm. That, I thought, was really, really good. That was, that was twisted bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the way it happened, and the fact that he, you know, he mistakenly killed his own girlfriend. Um, <laughs> it's not something you see very often. Um, but no, I thought it, the effects were good. The action was good. If you're saying it was a million and a half budget, I thought they rinsed every cent out of it, and it looked really good. Um, so the only slightly roper bit is when the building blows up. But obviously, they didn't have the budget to blow it up, so they've done it slightly CGI or whatever, but no, apart from that, well, it was absolutely great. Really enjoyed it. The only ropey bit for me, um, and, and it was purely sort of to pad the time out a bit, is when uh, Scott Atkins' character, he basically has a dream slash nightmare about everything that had happened in the film up to that moment. It is as if somebody was watching the film on fast forward in, in dream form, and it's like, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know? It's mm. it's purely just a sort of inch inch the running time sort of closer to ninety minutes as it could, but um, other than that, I was I was quite impressed. Obviously, they got um, they got Tim Mann handling the um, the fight choreography. He's worked with uh, Scott on numerous projects before, including Accident mm. Man and uh, uh, Ninja Shadow of a Tear, um, and I think he did a really good job of matching sort of Dolph and Scott. You know, so I mean, you know, we we we're very well aware of how good Scott Atkins is as a as a screen performer, um, and you know, Tim managed to make Dolph, who is you know an accomplished fighter himself, but with a completely different style, 
of sort of screen fighting, but he, he did a really good job of sort of matching the two. Um, so so mm. it did look that they're more or less equal, you know, when, when it comes to sort of fisticuffs. Yeah. Well, what's also what's also interesting about this one, and again, the, these are little aspects that you just don't get in many of these um, direct-to-video uh, action vehicles. I mean, you guys mentioned uh, a Bruce Willis film earlier. And the thing that you, again, have to appreciate about this one is that they give so much to, um, in terms of character development, to Scott Atkins' character and Dolph Lundgren's character. You would not get that kind of character development um, uh, for, you know, for your leads oh, like that. Yeah. The, yeah, I think the, yeah. the unfortunate trade off with that, however, though, is again, because it is this small, independent, low budget flick is the villains. OK, our villains in this film really are pretty much given absolutely nothing in this film. And so and on, I was I was watching, I was like, man, those villains are pretty weak. I kind of wish we were given a little something more. But mm. I think Dolph was of the opinion where he kind of thought, you know what? It, it's it's going to be one or the other. Now, if this was a bigger budget, you know, thing like something like a Michael Bay or something like that, then of course we would have been given, you know, every facet of the production of the story, for that matter, the narrative would have been uh, would have been covered. He would have had all bases covered. But I think, you know, considering the nature of what they're working with, they kind of had to do one or the other. And I was okay with that, to be honest. Yeah, if it, if it had the budget, mm. you know, an extra ten, an extra ten minutes sort of spent with with the bad guys, sort of setting them up and things would have been nice. But no, I agree. Um, it, other other than sort of the main sort of guy and his girlfriend, the the rest of them were just sort of, you know, cannon fodder, weren't they? Really? Didn't really yeah. Which is which is hilarious because Richard, you and I were talking about this. If you yep. look at the um, <clears throat> if you look at the DVD and Blu-ray um cover for this one, okay, they pretty much that is the exact cover that was used when they were shopping this film around, um, trying to get sales and trying to get financing. And they didn't change anything about it. So it, it's almost kind of laughable. It reminds me kind of the early 2000s, late 90s, when Steven Seagal did his, uh, you know, a lot of his direct-to-video films. If you look at it, it appears that that's Nakatomi Plaza in the middle. And there's a bunch mm -hmm. of commandos with mm -hmm. masks. They're not in the films. And then Dolph is wearing these sunglasses on the cover, which he doesn't wear in the film. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because the IMDb synopsis for the film basically says, rival gangs seek out millions of dollars hidden inside a luxury condominium. Interesting. That, that's scheduled yeah. to be demolished. But first they have to deal with the janitor who's found the loot first. So so oh, obviously okay. there's been a, been a few... Um, you know, conceptual uh, changes, yeah. Re re yeah. along the way. Yeah. Well, that must, I, I'm I, guessing the I, janitor I, thing was changed when Scott Adkins came aboard, and then they added that whole bit at the start where yeah. it's um, where he's. A, a, I think that's exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah, and they also realized again, like I said earlier, it's much easier to dress up a half-built set that we're going to um, consider as being "quote unquote" demolished than a luxury condominium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Where was the film set as well? What 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 city was it? Birmingham, set? Alabama. It was, it was filmed out there too, actually. Yeah. 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 Not, and there's that many. great joke where Scott Adkins says, "I'm from Birmingham." Oh yeah. But not yes. the other one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was great. I was going to say Scott is very easygoing in this one. You know, he's he's yeah. got a really nice rapport with his um, with the other characters. You know, he, he, even the the woman trying to find him a job. You know. <laughs> It, well, um, this is de this is debt collector Scott, basically. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I, I liked it. I like, you know, I like the you know he makes makes a friend on the site, and uh, you know he's he's quite easy going, and and until he finds some money, and it's like oh, it sort of changes, but so it's good. There are a slight. I mean, I, I know where this is. You know, kind of uh, you know. Grabbing at straws here, I guess we can say. But um, you know, the, Richard and I were talking about it. You know, there's a few things that I kind of wish maybe someone had been on set. You know, a script supervisor, if you will, mm -hmm. or maybe they they might have looked at the dailies and kind of thought, is that the, does that play out well? I mean, case in point, um, Richard pointed this out to me, um, and I went back and I I had to watch it. But there is a scene. Okay, so the hospital is called Castle Heights, but there is a scene where one of the characters does call it Castle Falls oh, and they right. didn't and they didn't catch that. And then the other part is, so Scott Atkins uh, befriends one of the uh, construction or one of the demolition workers in the mm -hmm. film. And uh, he's talking to Scott about how, uh, you know, he, he plans on taking his money and going to Alaska and being 
amorous with some Alaskan gals. But then at the end, we find out that he has, yeah. you know, and it's kind of like, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of out of the blue, wasn't it? It was like, hang on a minute. It was never mentioned, you know, he never actually mentioned about he's got a wife and kids at home sort of thing. That's a rewritten <laughs> ending, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe that was shot early, and then you know, never never quite got round to fixing it. But yeah. wouldn't it have made more sense then just to show Scott Adkins going out? Well, sorry, spoiler, but him moving out to Alaska and maybe giving the rest of that money to um, Dolph and his daughter because mm. they they don't give us any closure whatsoever with yeah. uh, with Lundgren's daughter. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm. you got you, you got to assume that yeah, he, he obviously got his share and you know sort of sort of things out of his end and it's, it's, but yeah it, it, it's weird that that got missed out how did you feel about the setup mike at the beginning where we really focus on uh it, it's not it, it's not quite in media res but you know it's kind of like an ex, it's almost like an extraneous extra mm. scene of, of a of a of a fight that scott uh, scott does a fight scene at the beginning mm. just to sort of set up his character but it's it's not really needed um but it I quite liked it. I thought it sort of it was, was a, a good, nice lead. It, it, it's yeah. a good fight. It, it, it says a lot about his character <clears throat> and and about his sort of physical condition. Mm. Um, and again, you know, know, it's 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 back to sort of debt collector sort of territory, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it gives him that impetus to get the job in construction, mm. you know, because he's yeah. too old, washed up. Mm. He won't get put on the card or anything like that. So, mm. yeah, it does work well. What, yeah, I, what, what I did like the... about that is, is you know, he's he's able to keep his ego in check. You know, he, he, um, he, he spoilers. You know, he he loses that fight at the beginning because mm. because a he's he's too honourable and and b because he's he's carrying an um uh, an injury which is exploited. Yeah. So, but he. Well, that's you know, what I like. I love about yeah. that that scene is you know yeah. that is a great character scene and that comes yeah. back at the end as a, yeah, he, as a, a he, he back takes it, in the mm. films exactly but he, ta he takes it on the chin and goes mm. yeah right <laughs> you know <laughs> he accepts his position rather than sort of trying to be all mouthy about it which is what I kind of like there you go and when we move away from scott and we're introduced to to dolph because uh, mm. i think dolph's is come dolph comes in second if i recall correctly and yeah it, it, there's a lot of, there's all the drama with his daughter and everything i thought that was brilliantly played i mean the film really for the first part of it mm. it feels a lot more like a drama than mm. an than an action movie it's very uh if i don't know if you when i was watching it, i felt there wasn't really much music for a for a long time it was it was very observational mm. at times quite handheld you know sort of emphasizing this you know quite gritty really to to an extent yeah. and uh I really, I thought that gave it a real interesting quality. And then when the action kicks in, uh, using all like it, it was, it sort of moves along, but it, it feels like a natural progression. And the, um, what was I going to say? It, it reminded me a lot of, of oddly enough, um, British uh, action directors recently. So the, the, the way the, the limited number of, you know, locations, the sort of um, abandoned locations, basically, and how well they're shot, Really reminded me a lot of uh, Ross Boyasque's uh, I, "I Am Ven," mm -hmm. or sorry, mm -hmm. "I Am Vengeance Retaliation," too, yeah. uh, and yeah. also um, James Nunn's films. Uh, I yep. think um, Mike, did you mention Marine, or, or was that? Uh, yeah, one? so so the Marine Five, Five. Yeah, was was James Nunn's one. Yeah, um, and, Which and I, that, that didn't even come to mind to me. I was thinking because yeah. that's not like, I'm not I'm not actually that fond of that film, but just in terms of the aesthetic and you yeah. know really ringing the most out of a of a limited yeah, location that was, that was set in a multi-story car park and then mm. a constructed site at the end so, yeah yeah but yeah so um scores on the doors let's start with sean oh i'm i'm sorry i had to step away briefly i'm sorry what was that <laughs> scores on the doors matey out oh score oh sorry out of 10 out of 10 oh okay score um you know, it's it's not my favorite um, Lundgren film, but uh, you know, I mean, it's it's still a very solidly made. I guess uh, with with ten being the ten, ten's the best, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, um, I'm gonna give this one. Uh, you know what? Considering, <laughs> oh boy, considering a lot of the uh, stuff that he's done of late that have gone direct to video, especially that I've covered on the podcast, this was a breath of fresh air. So I'm gonna give it a seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve. Uh, yeah, I'll go over seven as well. 
really enjoyable. Yeah, and Rich. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's a strong. It's good to see Dolph and Scott together again in a in a in a in a, in a, in a film where they're properly sharing uh, top billing. You know, mm. no Jean Claude Van Damme or anything this time around. And uh, I thought they they worked well together. Good to see Scott. Um, I, I always prefer it when it's Scott being hit more natural. You know, not putting on mm. an American accent and all that sort of stuff. So that all works really well. Um, the fact that the film evokes strong memories of Trespass, uh, yep. Walter that's Hill the other film, one we didn't mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. is um, mm-hmm. is no bad thing because uh, you know that makes oh, that, that was a really that is quite a classic, fairly forgotten film. So mm-hmm. I do really want to try and see that again. But there's there's definitely been an influence, perhaps unintentionally, I don't know. But the, the, there are some quite strong similarities. Um, but I like I didn't mind that. I liked it. Uh, and the dramatic sort of stuff I thought worked really well. I'd give it an eight. An eight, nice. Oh, I really like King Kim DeLonghi as as Cat, the the low, mm-hmm. the obligatory lone mm-hmm. female member of the of the mm-hmm. antagonist te- uh, antagonist team. I thought there was something really interesting going on there with Scar and everything. Mm-hmm. They didn't dwell on it too much, but she was really good. Yeah, I I must admit, uh, when I originally saw the trailer for this, I did not have high hopes at all. Um, some of Dolph Lundgren's stuff can be a bit ropey, so Sean. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I must admit, I was worried that he was going to be pulling sh- um, Scott down with him, you know. But that's not the case at all. This is it is a very solid um, seven out of ten. Um, it it's better than some of his other films. From I'm looking at this purely from a Scott Atkins point of view. Um, for, for example, I, I prefer this over Seized, you know, the, the one with Mario. Oh, definitely, and yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. This is a much more solid film for me. Um, the, the two work well together. Um, I mean, the, the last film I, where, where Dolph Lundgren was in the lead that I actually enjoyed was Icarus. I thought that was very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dolph Lundgren was doing his best Lee Marvin impression in that one. Which um, he also directed that one, I believe. He did, that's right, yeah. yeah. And that, that, that was really good. Um but you know things like Riot. I thought, thought Riot was really good, but he only had a small part in that. Uh, so, so this was really good, and I'm glad that sort of Tim Man managed to sort of you know make both of them look really good on you know, as screen fighters. They both had some good stuff um, going on. So yeah, that's the seven for me. So this week that is three sevens and an eight for Castle Falls. Go check it out. Our next review then is Achura. Dark, long forgotten memories from their childhood suddenly return for three former friends when a dormant creature is unwittingly unleashed. Uh, I believe this is our first French slash Moroccan film, uh, Rich. Don't think we've had one before. Yeah, I don't recall covering a Moroccan mm-hmm. uh, film previously, mm-hmm. so yeah, you might be right. Yeah, uh, this is yet another film from Dark Star Productions as well. Uh, we, we, we've had a lot from them recently, and they've all been crackers. Uh, we, um, the, the, the Last Matinee um, was definitely one oh, of yeah. theirs. Uh, Ankle Biters yeah. was another, and uh, a, a film that I covered on my we- uh, website, uh, The Cold Dead Look in Your Eyes. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's another film from tonight um, that they've done as well. But um, I'm going to kick this one straight over to Will. What did you make of Atura? Um, I thought it was brilliant. Um, I really did. Uh, it was, you know, for 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 a folk horror movie um, with, like you say, it's the first it's the, it's the first uh, Moroccan French, um, well, I'd say Moroccan movie. Um, a lot of the language is in French, although in Morocco they speak French and Arabic. Mm. Um, but it's the first it's the first Moroccan horror production i've i've watched and it, and it was awesome um you, you know i mean it's a it's a i don't know enough about it to know whether it's a folk history that's got like you know like sort of ancient fairy tale roots in in uh in morocco but it it was yeah it just it just delivered from start to finish creepy title sequence you know with the kids drawings of um you, you know like the 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 creature the you know mm. the, the long dormant monster um and they they kids drawings in a title sequence with a kind of classical music score just always works for me sets the tone for a for for a brilliant movie i wouldn't say it was i mean there's a lot of things in it that would seem familiar um horror plot wise 
but production wise acting wise direction narrative it was it was just engaging from start to finish and really really well made professional movie i enjoyed it thoroughly yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, especially the monster. Um, I thought, well, that was a great design. Um, Steve, uh, what do you make of Atura? Yeah, I kind of agree with Will. Um, <clears throat> I thought the performance was great. The direction was great. I think the only thing that kind of let it down slightly was some of the CGI on the monster. A couple of bits. And what It looks a little bit unfinished. But... Mm. Um, no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I like the way how it just didn't give it your all front. You know, you had like the flashbacks and because about halfway through, I'm like, well, what's, what's going on? Because there's, there's that many, that, that many different stories, but the way they actually converge them and they actually, they actually works for once, yeah. not like it's just, they're just thrown together. They actually kind of thought about it and it worked out really well. It kind of, Reminded me of, of it in a way, you know, like, you know, battling yep. the monsters, kids, and then again as grown ups and stuff like that. But mm. yeah, I thought it was great. Really, really enjoyed it. Mm. <clears throat> uh, Rich. Yeah, it's funny should, uh, Steve should mention it because when I was watching it, that was exactly what came to mind for me um, the, after the initial setup, was, which was very intriguing and, and great performances from the young kids and excellent production values it soon became apparent uh, with the character introductions and the flashback structure and everything that I felt like I was watching it chapter two and oh, duh. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, which, and because even, uh, even the creature, the, the Bugatat, uh monster hunts children. And, you know, there's a, there's a death of a child at the start of the film in, in very similar to um, like Georgie and Pennywise and, and then they have to confront it, uh, you know, as grown ups. So, so it's, I was thinking it, it's very, very similar. What's funny is that this was actually uh, released, orig- initially released uh, domestically, I presume, a year before it, chapter two. Mm. So it's not like it's mm. made as a, ri- it, it, it's not really possible that it could have been made as a rip off. I think it's just coincidence, it's either coincidence or perhaps they were familiar with the Stephen King novel and they sort of oh, threw okay. on that. It's hard to say, but the the the, the similarities are, v- you know, very apparent. It's much better because I didn't like it chapter two at all. It was, you know, big and baggy, and the, you know, I didn't like the sequences. This is very, uh, uh, it's very tight. You know, that everything's really engaging. The, you know, the, the mythology, the sort of mix of languages, and the characters and their arcs are all fascinating. You know, there's that boy who's who goes missing and he comes back and he's got he, he's got like this bit in his uh, mouth you know he's being sort of treated like a dog and stuff and all that stuff's amazing and uh the, there's some some of the visual effects are a little bit ropey but the creature itself when it appears is is, is really impressively designed i think yeah i totally agree i i wasn't mm. sure about this right at the beginning um that that opening sequence in the past uh with mm. the girl uh you know just the way she sort of like she gets abducted by the monster I was like okay here we go it, it's the black smoke again that you know that really really scary yeah. black smoke um which is the sort of cgi bit that you know you guys are alluding to really um and I wasn't sort of paying attention for a little bit and, and as you say you know there's, there's these disparate characters you know you've got the detective who's like obsessed with some sort of pedophile case and having to sort of watch these videos over and over again, he got the, um, you know, the artist and his sister. That bit I really did like, you know, with the um, his his installation piece, which is like a performance art, to try and sort of force her to remember what had happened. So I thought that was really good and really creepy. Um, and it, it slowly started to gel together because you know you had these different bits, like you say, the, the guy with the bit in his mouth, been, you know, been maltreated so you don't know where that's going and then you know that that sort of moment of kindness turns out to be probably the worst thing he could have done it's um it was really good and it's it, you know it sort of coalesced into this really good um sort of uh, sort of horror movie um it does compare very favorably with with it um i, I, I 
sort of join you guys in, in that comparison, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was very solid. There's some really good camera work as well, like like um, there's a bit towards the end where the camera goes down the centre of a spiral staircase. It sort yeah. of drops yeah. down. It was, it was really, really impressive. So yeah, this this was very, very solid work. Um, okay, so scores on the doors. Uh, I'll start with Will. Um, I, I can't fault it. I think you know, I I, I was it's up it's up there with the very best that um, that we've reviewed on here, um, with very little to to detract from it. And I I would like I would really like to give this an eight. Um, and I, and I think if I may just you know waffle on just for just for a minute um, while, while giving the scores, a lot of that is for while I think that this the effects apart from the black smoke obviously which is a bit hackney were were brilliant um the I think that the the script and the performances were were so good um the, the script was un, like it was underwritten and gave a lot of room for for great acting uh, so I, so I just want to interject there as well there's one element which they, they they did a good job of underplaying and allowed the audience to join the, the dots, which was you had the the ceremony of Ashura, as, as it's called at the beginning of the film, where the kids splash each other with water and wear masks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we find out later on that this creature is affected by water. Pivotal. But it but it, but it yeah. doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't so like ram it down your throat. It's just like yeah, you got you got this over here, and you got that, and the, and the two the two are related. But you you know the audience has to join the dots as to why that ceremony, you know, that sort of traditional ceremony takes place, and why why they sort of like soak each other with water and stuff. It's, it's, I thought I thought that was a really really deft touch. Yeah, and and, mm. and one of many. I mean, one mm. of one of a lot. Just like a lot of little things in there. The you know the the, the locket mm. um, that uh, Sammy wanted to not that that. Um, Ali wanted to give Nadia, hmm. yeah. you know, like they, they didn't, you know, they didn't say anything about it. And then it, it was like a totem, wasn't it? Totemistic thing that hmm. he just pressed it, somebody pressed it into his hand. There was a hmm. lot of moments in there that were really great bits of writing and direction and acting came together and it wasn't rammed down your throat like it is in a lot of, you know, sort yeah. of uh, a horror movie. Yeah. Type. And I just think that in itself and on its, of itself deserves deserves an eight. I just I was just impressed. Cool, uh, Steve. Yeah, uh, I've got to agree, an eight definitely. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Performances were absolutely amazing. I thought the script was really well handled, really well shot. I, yeah, I can't fault it. It's just that little bit of CGI that took me out of it slightly, but apart from that, yeah, it was cracking. Yep. And Rich? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go for an eight. And also mention that a film that came to mind when I initially started watching it was um, uh, Into the Labyrinth. And I think, mm. it, it, although it's a different kind of movie, uh, that's an Italian one. Uh, I think, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a, a, a good sort of thrilling double bill of uh, international cinema, I think uh, uh, this and uh, Into the Labyrinth would be a, a good bet. Yeah. Yeah, good shot. Yeah, I'm joining you guys on an eight. As I said, you know, it didn't grab me at the beginning, uh, but it it it, um, you know, it stuck with it, and it eventually sort of paid off. The um, this you know the story and the characters started to come together. The mythology was great. The creature was great, um, and the you know the Sophie's Choice moment at the end. Mm. Um, mm. Again, you know, I, I thought that was really well played, and I was I was actually really surprised with with the way they went with that. But there you go. Um, the yeah, kids were great, they? The kids yeah. Were great. so four eights for um, Achura. Go check it out. Our next review is Portal Runner. After a bizarre accident, 15 year old Nolan finds he can use mirrors to pass between alternate dimensions, and just as well because an evil force is stalking him. Each time Nolan jumps to a new reality, there are small changes for him to deal with, but nothing could prepare him for his latest version of his life. Um, okay, Steve, over to you straight away. Yeah, um, <clears throat> kind of like, um, well, obviously it's like a 90s throwback, really, because it's kind of set on the eve of Y2K. 
Mm. And that that threw me quite a bit because there's a lot of that in the film. And I didn't get why. It, it just seemed a bit strange. It was it was okay. It was quite man like an like an eighties ambling type thing. Mm. Really, you know, it's not it's not too scary. There's a little bit of scariness in there, but it'd be fine to show younger kids. I'm, I'm reckoning it's about a 12. Maybe. I reckon so, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so or PG-13, so. whatever, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's okay. I mean, some of it, it, it's a bit too, not comedic, but some of the characters are a little bit over the top, like the uncle. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's basically just trying to build his bunker for end of the world and stuff like that. Um, but I thought the two leads, the the Nolan and it, is it May, I think his sister. Yeah, that's right. I thought they were thought they were really good. Um, the script's a bit a bit hokey. I mean, I, I, if you analyse it really, I don't think it holds up to its own rules, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, but all in all, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's quite enjoyable. It's, and it's I, only what is it an hour and ten minutes as well? Yeah, that's so seventy. Yeah. I I love this. Yeah. I thought this was superb. Um, it's 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 low budget for sure. The you know the, oh, yeah. the effect the effects are minimal, and you know and, and I agree that you know I I could easily see Disney taking this material and you know g- giving it a bit more of a sheen, but mm. but not it's really. Funny you should say that because when I was because I, I only I'm fortunate I confess I only gave it a cursory glance, but. It when I was watching it or half watching it, it did have a, a Disney Channel kind of mm. to it. Yeah, yeah. I I, I just thought <clears> this really. Well. I thought the script was really good. Um, I thought that you know the the banter between uh, Nolan and May was, was was very well handled. I thought May uh, played by um, Elise Ebel. I thought she was the star of the show. Basically, she, she nailed it. There's a, there's a whole argument she has with um, her off again on again boyfriend Gordo mm. um which I thought was superb I thought you know she absolutely nailed that um yeah I, I just really really enjoyed this I, I thought it worked really well the, the, the Y2K stuff um you know that there was that big scare at the time and there's a really you know it's an interesting cameo from uh, Robert Picardo from um yeah uh, Star Trek Voyager where he's nice. trying to sell this sort of like um <laughs> Basically, look. It looks like uh, bubble wrap gloves, <laughs> you know. For yeah, like 10 know. Did Did you um? Did you skip skip the end credits? Hmm. Was well, so another bit. I keep I keep doing that to myself, missing bits. It was, ba- it was basically the the whole advert. All right. Uh, right at the end of it, it was quite fun actually. Um. But, yeah, I, was, I like the character of the the uncle. I thought I thought he was quite quite amusing. Um. Yeah, no, I, I just thought it really worked. I, you know, the little changes to the different sort of universes and that. Um, mm. But yeah, there, there's in, um, sort of the best bit of acting in it, funny enough, is the woman who plays uh, Nolan and May's mum. I'm not yeah. sure what her name is. But there's, there's a bit where she's coming down the stairs saying one thing sees what's happening in front of her and, and you see the whole reaction on her face you know mm. she, she absolutely nails it um you know the, the whole sort of shifting emotions from yeah. from one state to the next. I, I thought she, that particular moment was was excellent um yeah it's, it's just one of those nice sort of low budget independent films that we we, we cover now and again um you know stayed within its budget and, and i thought did a really really good job yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like I say, it wasn't terrible. It's just a, a little bit of the scripts I thought could have done with a bit of a polish. And, the only, yeah. the only real thing for me was <clears throat> was the character of Nolan. Uh, he's, he's meant to be fifteen in the film, but there are mm. a couple of scenes where I think, like in an earlier draft, he was supposed to be played younger. You know, the thing the thing about the yeah. la- the ladybug plushy thing. Yeah, I think he's going on about his. Yeah, story. I thought I thought maybe. <laughs> He was meant to be a bit younger, but um, other than that, I, th- I thought they, they absolutely nailed it. Uh, so, yeah, I, um, I'm going to give this one um, an 8 out of 10. I'll give it a 6. Mm-hmm. Bit of a difference of opinion there, but uh, yeah. a, six, a 6 and an 8 for Portal Runner. Go check it out. <laughs>
Our next review is The Darkness of the Road. Siri and her daughter Eve are traveling across country in a battered old car. When Siri meets Iris at a gas station, she agrees to give her a lift. But soon after, Eve disappears and the car is attacked by a strange creature. Um, okay, straight over to Steve. Yeah, um, didn't get along with this one, to be fair. It, I thought it was very confusing, very trippy. No real story to speak of. And it just confused the hell out of me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and then when it started to go all, like, cabin in the woods bit, right at the end, it, it yeah, I know. And it, it, there's a couple of scenes that are very, very, very grim and could be actually quite triggering for some people. Mm. Um, <clears throat> quite upsetting, a couple of them. Um, but yeah, I, it just felt a bit flat. You know, you know, nothing really happened of any significance. And by the end, I was just a bit, a bit bored, to be fair. Mm hmm. Uh, Rich, it's good to see Najara Townsend again after her stint on uh, in The Stylist. Um, how did you grab this? Sorry, start doing that again. How did this film grab you? Uh, I was initially very interested in it because it's directed by Eduardo Rodriguez, who made uh, the Scott Adkins film El Gringo, which oh, yeah. I, mm. I was really fond of. He's also done things like um, Stash House with Dolph Lundgren and Fright Night 2. Uh, the the new Friday night, uh, you know, the new sequel. Uh, That's the one set in Romania or something. Uh, not Romania. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll be yeah. honest. I haven't actually seen it. But the only Eduardo Rodriguez film I'd seen before was yeah. El Gringo, which I thought was was you know, I I really liked it. I thought it was very stylish. Um, they they did quite you know creative things and it it, it looked good budget. This is really low budget, uh, and I was quite surprised that you know how um uh, how different it was to you know what 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 i've seen him do you know uh before you know obviously in just that one instance but uh knowing that he's worked on bigger things like um stat, you know fright night 2 and stuff um so what we've got here is essentially two locations one of which is the gas station the other is a road uh, and most of it takes place parked in the middle of a road uh, and you know that all taking place around the confines of uh, of the of the characters the main character's car and it it they try you know there's a lot of emphasis on you know the cinematography and the colors and everything to try and make it a bit more make it more interesting uh, and that but it it felt to me um you know like we've seen this kind of thing before and recently as a recent example i'd say uh, the Silent Hill fan film that we watched, mm -hmm. where everything's sort mm -hmm. of, you know, are, is it a dream <clears throat> thing? What's going on? You know, we're not quite sure. Um, it, you know, have they moved into another plane, or, 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 or you know, what's going on there? And in a, in a similar vein, um, um, Hellraiser DTV sequels have all that have done all this. Yep. You know, again, we watched a couple recently, but the, this could have easily, you know, there's that sort of weird low. Um, a ghost man sort of thing that looks like the um the alien you know the aliens in cocoon yeah. kind of yeah. thing he's it's just like sort of sort of a white entity just done you in know. negative isn't it basically it's yeah mm. so you change that for a cenobite and you've got mm. a hellraiser film basically it's you know a hellraiser you know dtv sequel you know not not like the, not like the original clive barker stuff mm -hmm. but and uh it just didn't. It it wasn't grabbing me. Uh, uh, Open twenty four hours was another film that came to mind, in part due to the um, the initial scenes in the in the gas station. But yeah, I was just I was quite disappointed by it. Really, I was thought I thought there would be more. It, 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 it there didn't seem to be a lot of substance. It was quite low budget and not very original. There's not a lot to you know. There's not a lot to latch on to. I didn't mm. think. Yeah. I've, I think I liked it a little bit better than you. <clears> two. <throat> um, that's not to say I liked it a lot. The, there were issues, starting with what, what am I going to start with, guys? In media res. In media yes. res yeah. However, by the end of the film, 
I was actually quite pleased with that bit of in media res because it added to that conclusion, uh, which which is surprising because you know for once it is something that the, that the writer has thought out rather than something the the producers or the studio have decided to slap on because they think the audience is going to get bored. Um, so, so kudos for that. You actually sort of gave me a bit of immediate res that I don't mind. Which is Edu so Eduardo Rodriguez actually wrote this one himself, I think. Cool. Um, the Jar of Townsend was pretty good on this. Um, the, the issue really is, as you said, Rich, we've kind of seen this sort of thing before. It's not mm. as clever as it thinks it is um, as to what's going on. I mean, not the whole thing, you know, but definitely got some strong suspicions as as to the sort of direction it's heading in and in, in fact there was a film with um sam waterstone uh which was on i think it was on netflix uh where he similar sort of situation where his daughter goes missing in the hospital um and he's, he's trying to sort of convince the um you know the doctors and nurses that he he did actually come in with a, with a, with his daughter mm -hmm. you know so so there's that sort of thing as well oh you know uh, the other the other one i was reminded of do you remember the couple they were on they went to france they went to stay in a guy's house yes oh, yeah, 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 yeah 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 that i was also with the reminded dogs. of that one as well yeah exactly we, we you know yeah. we we reviewed 166 films this year and you know the chances of, of, of hitting us with something you know original are, are pretty slim really um, as, as we've already seen with the Chura and uh, Portal Runner tonight. So it doesn't get any marks for originality. It does get marks for cinematography. But there's a moment when um, um, Siri gets out of her car at the beginning and suddenly there's all these lightning flashes in the distance. Mm. I, I thought that was a really good image. And there's, there's a couple of others, you know, some really nice HD photography going on in this. Uh, I think the monster was crap. Um, yeah. That there were some, you know, there were some bad ideas, but I did like the conclusion and I liked the way it looped back round to the beginning. So, yeah, there's that, but um, it was not not what I was hoping, that's for sure. Anyway, on that note, how are we going to score this, uh, Steve? Um, I'll give it a five. Mm -hmm. And Rich, uh, I'll go five as well. I'm just going to pip you with a six. So two fives and a six for The Darkness of the Road. Go check it out. Our next film is Wrath of Man. When H joins a cash truck company, he's not just there to keep the money safe from robbers. He has an alternative motive. So this was a bit of a turn up for the books, guys. A Jason Statham mm. slash Guy Ritchie movie going straight to Amazon Prime in the UK. So fair pickings for us, of course, because it classes it as a DT DTV movie. Um, Steve, how did you get on with Wrath of Man? I really enjoyed this, actually. It was a lot twistier and a lot more plot heavy than I thought it would be. Um, you know, watching the trailer, you just think, oh, it's... You know, stay from mm. doing his usual shtick and, you know, let's play the hard man and do this and do that. But the way it unfolds, and I know it, you know, it's one of them that the timeline's jumping a bit ar around a bit. But to me, for once, it actually worked. And I mean, there's a couple of bits where stay from performance, if it was somebody else, it could have been. A little bit better but for what it is i, I really enjoyed it i was very surprised that this went straight to amazon to be fair i know yep. it's been out in the states for a, a good few months uh i think it was something like july when it came out over here and even at that point uh, sorry in america and at that point there was no release date set for it which is quite strange but yeah i, I actually really enjoyed this cool yep um rich yeah i think we're in that odd time you know where films used to go direct to video because the studios like lost didn't have faith in them or whatever and they just sort of put just think well we don't want to spend money on marketing or whatever let's just put it out on video and or dvd or whatever and now we're at the point where the streaming giants have just got so much money and they're so <laughs> you know they, they want really good stuff to draw in their 
you know draw in new subscribers so they'll they'll pay a fortune to uh, deny a film a cinema release you know <laughs> it's basically uh mm. bezos or whoever is going to go and say look i'll buy this off you you, you don't have to put it in the cinema. I'll give you the money that you would have made mm. <laughs> putting it in cinemas uh, and put it on thing. I think that's probably what's happened here because this, I think this would have cleaned up at the cinema. I think it would have done really I well. I think it, um, it, would, it had a yeah. good word of mouth, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. it already had really strong, I mean, you know, obviously Statham and, and Guy Ritchie are rolling in it, but I, I bet they're pretty gutted that, you know, it's been denied mm. any uh, theatrical release in their, in their native, you know, country. Yeah, I I like this, but possibly not as much as you guys. Um, you use the word repetition, um, and that's kind of how I felt about this. It kept repeating itself, um, especially with the you know the, that central heist bit, which is the linchpin of the film. It goes back to it three mm. different times from from different um, perspectives, but even yeah. so, I was like, this again. Here we go. Um, it, when it, where it livened up for me was when the the focus switched to the bank robbers, um, so like yeah, you know, like Scott Eastwood's character and things like that. I thought thought that was really good. That reminded me as well of Den of Thieves with um, Jared Butler. I don't know if you've seen that. No, no, yeah. but I, it's, I've it's, heard it's worth checking out. It's 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 pretty decent. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. I mean, to be fair. I agree with you. I mean, I thought that was quite brave, really, because, you know, you leave your main character for, like, mm. 20 minutes, half an hour, and it's a yeah. good chunk of the movie. Um, but, yeah, it, it did work. It did work. Mm -hmm. Interesting that um, Josh Hartnett's in this. Obviously, he uh, must have worked well with both Statham and um, Guy Ritchie because he's in their next film as well. Um, so so yeah. that's really cool. Um, Scott Eastwood, the more I see of him, the more he impresses me. Um, he was great in this. He was he was mm. very good in this. The sort of I haven't seen him play like that. that. I haven't seen him play a, a proper character sort of like this before. I mean, usually he's kind of like the handsome guy, mm. you know. And, mm. and you know, him and Statham had previously done Fast and Furious Eight. Yeah, and, right, and yeah. Scott Eastwood in that is like completely forgettable. You know, he's yeah. like, it's just like a side character, mm. or whatever. In this, he is he's menacing. He's he's yeah. got that. He's got a little bit of makeup on his eye and stuff and. Mm. Uh, He's he's yeah. the way he's saying his dialogue and stuff. He's he's really good in the outpost as well, which is also on. Mm. Uh, on um, also, um, shout out to Holt McAnally. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. He, he, I love him. I mean, I've I've only really seen him in um, like Mind Mind Hunters stuff like mm -hmm. that on Netflix. But yeah. See, every, that, every time I see him, I think is that right. Bullet? I really do. Yeah, yeah. It's bullet. Yeah, 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 yeah I he, love Bullet. Um, he was my yeah, favorite character because because. The, the film I remember him mostly from is uh, Michael Mann's Black Hat, but um, yeah, he, he's one of those memorable faces. You know, once you mm -hmm. see him, it's like ah, great, he, uh, he's in this. Uh, yeah. He's that sort of character actor. So yeah, uh, Rich, uh, back no, back to you. Uh, so I, I, hopefully <laughs> I won't drop out. Um, I was thinking, you know, this is a film very much in the tradition of films like Get Carter, like we we talked about a Get Carter remake. Mm -hmm. Recently, mm. you know, Point Blank, for example, is something, and also yeah. uh, one that came to mind was Wake of Death with uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. Jean Claude, yeah. Because you know how in, do you remember how in that film there's that that torture sequence where Van Damme basically exits and he leaves his, his yeah. guys to it, mm. and this film basically does the same thing, and he, he's got his 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 guy Mike and who I who I also loved, and he looks great with his mm. uh, with his white beard and, and hair and stuff. So he's a great character. Um, so Wake of Death is kind of also in that tradition. I would say also a revenge-driven uh, film. Mm -hmm. um, another film that came to mind, which I didn't like, which I don't like, is Armoured, which was the oh, Armoured yeah. Car movie yeah, yeah. with uh, Matt Dillon. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever saw that one, where the, the um, uh, where the, the yeah they're armored, stuck in the Armoured Car, basically sat they? around an Armoured yeah. Car yeah. and people trying to get into it. And stuff. Um, so similar, there's some similarities there um there were some things there were some nuances to the plotting which i didn't quite pick up on first time around so i was a little bit confused but i've watched it twice and uh it is you know if you're paying attention it, it is very clear but um it took me a, a second viewing to you know um to figure out oh hang on why was 
at, why was he there and why do they not know this and mm. you know, different mm. different things and uh yeah so i think it is very well done. i mean i think the script's really good i mean there's some great banter dialogue and stuff which is typical richie but uh it's <coughs> it's a bit um it's got a bit of a it's got a very different tone to what guy ritchie's well known for it's it's a much darker film but there is that bit of bit of humor and banter and interplay and you know that there's plenty of characters yeah. and i i think the fact that they've sold it as a jason statham movie just showing jason statham on the poster is misleading mm. because so many other characters in the film get get you know get time i mean there's a whole section of the film where jason statham's not even involved mm. you know for quite a period of time and uh, so i think that i think that's a I think that's a bit of it. This is very much typical, you know, compare it to like Revolver or whatever. You remember like vast cast you had around um, around Statham in that. This is basically the same, but the marketing is focusing on Statham. So if you're going in expecting to be with Statham all the time, as I was, that can be, that is quite jarring when you go like, well, hang on a minute, where is he now? Kind of thing. And uh, the other characters do sort of outshine him at, at several stages, except in the action, of course. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Scores on the doors for Wrath of Man. Let's start with Steve. Um, I'll give it an eight. Okay, and Rich. <clears throat> uh, I, yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, def definitely an eight from me. Yeah, high yeah. eight. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going with a seven on this one. Um, enjoyed it, but I, I, I did find it a little bit too repetitive. Um, but there you go. Just me. Okay, two eights and a seven for Wrath of Man. It's available on Net on Netflix. It's available on Amazon Prime. Go check it out. Our short shot this week is The Hunt, Savage Within. In a Philippine jungle, a special ops team are on a search and destroy mission. They are joined by a peculiar guest and their prey may be hunting them. Um, let's go straight over to Will. Yeah, um, highly, highly enjoyable. Um, you, I kind of, um, I, I did go into this cold. I like doing that, you know, not reading anything um, or having any idea at all what I'm watching. Um, uh, and not at all because I, I simply don't, you know, prepare myself properly to do my job. Of course. Um, uh, well, that, that, that second bit is the truth. Um, so. I didn't really know what was going on. I was watching it, thinking like trying to sort of, sort of thinking. They had the, had the look and feel of quite a lot of, um, and I'm not trying to do it down. A lot of kind of Star Wars fan films, and I was like, you know, is that dude a Jedi? And <laughs> um, you know, you know the guy I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, it became obvious when they were using M4s that that probably wasn't, you know, um, a Star Wars fan film. And I was just sort of settled in and started watching it, and. You know, it, it obviously it starts right in the middle of a pursuit, mm. and you have to pick it up as as you as you're going along, and um, it rattles along at an incredible pace. They pack a lot in um, action wise. Um, they don't fill you in on any details with the with the dialogue. They just get straight onto the action. I thought it was really. I thought it was you know as a as a, as a short as a primer for someone trying to get you know to get the to get the full version made i thought it was a really a really good effort quite frankly um the creature effects the creature effects were all right i mean like you know the, the sort of the it was makeup wasn't it, it was prosthetics yeah. mm -hmm. but they did a really good job with the cgi in the in the combat sequences <clears throat> i thought mm -hmm. they used it, they used they used what they had well um and this the story arc did actually remind me of a there was a Star Wars fan film I watched um, a couple of years ago, which I don't know if you actually, if I was directed to watch it by you, I don't think we, I don't think you reviewed it, but it was kind of like a little, a little story about one of the bounty hunters, the lizard-looking fella in oh, yeah. Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, and, yeah, that um, was one we covered. Yeah. Which is basically, so basically a predator it. film, but, but it, it was it was basically a predator film, but it was a Star Wars film kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Bosk the Bounty Hunter. That's it, yeah. Um, yeah, it was called Scorpion, this one, like a mashup. Yeah. Mm. That, yeah, that was it. That was it. This kind of had moments. Like, that's why I was saying, I thought, is this, you know, I, I was like, is this a similar type of thing? But no, I just, I thought it was, I thought it was really good. I mean, some of the, um, 
like when he got later on and there, there was like a bit of dialogue between the female lead and the, the kind of special ops commando guy mm. uh was perhaps a, just a you know a little bit kind of on the nose <laughs> yeah uh, just a bit sort of i don't know not the smoothest of deliveries but i just got the impression that it was like i don't think they were in the same place when they were delivering the lines maybe something like that do you know what i mean anyway yeah. it, but apart from that you know i mean it was just like yeah this is a really good taster like for something that obviously they've got a much bigger idea how the monster worked like how the how the creature worked and what it was doing i thought was you know was was, was pretty good and there was you're thinking yeah there's a lot more to this story um, and you kind of you, it kind of left you feeling intrigued, and you know what's what's going to go on. I don't think that the ending with the, with you know with how it went at the end, I wasn't totally convinced that uh, you know mm. it was going to go the way she kind of hoped it was. But you, you know, I mean, but it was it was I thought it was like a, a good, well encapsulated story that made you think, oh, I'd quite like to know what what they've got planned for the rest of it. Yeah, I I, I think this has got good bits and bad bits. Basically, I think it looks great for a start. Um, it got no problem with the acting or anything like that. Um, you know, plot exposition was kept to a minimum. It's a case of like, like use your eyes for God's sake. <laughs> uh, mm. There's one particular nice detail was the fact that nobody was phased by the fact that there was like an alien bounty hunter helping them out. Um, which, is, which yeah. is quite kind of nice. They, and, and, and you got the idea it's not the first time they've had to help out an alien bounty hunter who's sort of left something rather sort of um, uh, lethal sort of lying around the forest or something. The bit I absolutely adore in this is when the, the alien, because it's a shapeshifter, uh, it takes over the first body and he's acting like he's never seen a gun before. And as mm. they're walking along, he's staring mm. at it. He, he's flicking bits. He's pulling pulling levers and shit. You know, he, he's figuring out how it works while he's while he's walking. I thought that was absolutely superb. Mm. You know, that little sequence, I thought was brilliant. Um, but I felt a lot of this was a big tease. Uh, <laughs> it really was. There's a there's a, a setup where you've got this sort of Asian looking guy who's got a big fucking sword strapped to his back. And yeah. as he's reaching for it, it cuts to a completely different scene. And we never get to the fact fireworks factory is what I'm saying with that. Um, uh, that was a big tease. And then the ending, you know, I got a feeling they, they, they rummaged around their ass and sort of pulled it out at the last minute. <laughs> I mean, mm. nice, nice idea. Uh, just, just under the <clears throat> uh, And, it, it, you know, it, it reminded me of the ending of On Back 2 with um, Tony Jaa, because that just ends and basically says, well, if you believe in fairies, maybe he survives. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's, that's basically what it says. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like some of this, not all of it. It was it was good to see Laurent Bouhan, Bouhan? No, Busan involved in this. Uh, he's a French uh, stunt guy. He did a film a, a few years back which I've now forgotten the title of. I looked it up earlier. Um, but he's, he's worked on loads, loads of good stuff. Um, so, so it's good to sort of see him part of this for sure. Um, so Steve, over to you. Yeah, I kind of agree with you on this one, Mike. There were certain things I liked and certain things that I, I weren't too impressed with. I didn't like the main female character as such. She just seemed a bit of a, a wet lettuce in a way. And I just... How she survived, God, God only knows, really, to mm. be the last one standing. And the ending annoyed me because it was just, there's yeah. no conclusion to it. You know, it's mm. just left hanging completely. Um, but what you were saying, one bit I really did like was when he, he first, the shapeshifter first takes over mm. and he used the other guys as human shield. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the way he does it, you know. It's not like Arnie in Total Recall. He's he's holding the guy up straight in the air and just going at him with it. That bit I thought was really impressive. Um, but like you say, there is a lot of, you know, it doesn't get to the fire, which is like the way you said it, it, <laughs> it was fit perfectly. Um, you know, he, you got you've got him with a sword there, and he's just. You know what's coming. Mm. 
But yeah, but like Will was saying, I went into this call as well, and I'm thinking, well, this looks just like a, a Predator fan film, or you know, we're going for the jungle, there's like the guy with the shiny suit on or whatever. And okay, where's the predator? But obviously it's not. Um, but that's that's the kind of thing I was expecting. So it was nice not to have what I thought was coming in a way. But yeah, it's just a little bit yeah, underdeveloped, I think, is 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 the you've hit the nail on the head with it, really. Mm-hmm. Uh Rich, <clears throat> how about you? Yeah, echoing um the observations of the of you guys previously yeah the the whole thing that is it does it is it is predator basically so the comparisons to say mentioning the bosk score scorekeeper film or or any other uh, predator fan film or whatever are apt uh it is just a slight variation and obviously with a slightly sort of star trek or babylon 5 looking alien uh a bounty hunter or you know the the, the guy mm. taken in prisoner or something, whatever it was. Yeah, there's no exposition. But yeah, it's Predator. I mean, that scene that you're saying with um with the guy with the sword and you're not seeing what happens, yeah. that just makes me think of Sonny Landon and, the, and what happened with him in uh, in Predator. Oh, yeah. You, know, just, you yeah, just yeah. never get to mm. see his fate. Mm-hmm. Um the but then I thought but after that, you know, there is a moment with the sword and stuff. So you know I think I think it does pay off the way they did it, my my view anyway. Mm-hmm. The um the Philippine setting, not sure why, but maybe that's because it could have been anywhere. Literally, I mean, no, there's no, mm. there's nothing yeah. particularly Philippine as far as I could gather about any anything. You know, it's it's all in English and whatnot. The um, uh, it is it is what it does seem to be a proof of concept. Although I think it works as as a beginning, middle, end film. It does have a, a structure to it. The the savage within being the um the sort of the referring to the arc of the of that of that main female character who i think if if i look at the patch right i think she's meant to be a park ranger who's kind of oh, been yeah. drawn into this situation uh, you know, that doesn't make sense for the setting though does it i mean that's, that's weird and well, I, the forest I, I, ranger then yeah I, th- I think maybe they they need yeah, well, to put a bit more emphasis on on you know a bit more focus on her character if she was meant to be the because for a lot of it I, I didn't see her as the main character at all, sort of thing. You know, it, it just seems, oh, you, you'll do. You're, you're the last one standing. So we're, mm. we're kind, we're kind oh, of no, it's not, I mean, they establish earlier how nervous and that she is. And then mm. she, you know, then there's a bit later, <clears> she, you know, gets a bit more strength and, you know. Yeah, uh, but would she, be, would she be a part range in the Philippines as well? That's what I mean, yeah. You know, it, it, yeah, it just. Seems that's what that was what I mean about that particular yeah. setting thing not not quite making sense but I think yeah. I think uh, what it's funny because it doesn't actually it feels like it's more like the middle rather than a, let's say a prologue mm. you yeah. know if you were going to make another version of this this would this would have to sit in somewhere in the middle and uh, that's fine you know it's an unu- I've not I don't normally see it that way but the uh, you know like something like well, there's lots of proof of concepts we can code eight and that sort of thing. Anyway, but the uh, the production values I thought were excellent. I mean, when when the violence starts and you know the action sort of kicks in, I was really surprised. You know, when, when mm-hmm. the, the sort of uh, the you know uh, the knives come out. There's a bit of gore and you know the, the throwing people about and the and the jumping all over the place with the, the CGI works in or whatever. They, there's there's a lot in here that that's a bit yeah. above and beyond your average um short uh, sci-fi action film uh, so yeah i think i mean it's only 14 minutes um and i thought uh, yeah i thought it's uh, it's it's a you know it's borderline a blockbuster for this kind of thing i mm-hmm. think uh, so it's uh, mm-hmm. well worth checking out absolutely uh we don't score the shorts but we certainly recommend you check them out uh if you like the sound of this one you'll find a link to it in the footnotes below check it out Our DTV throwback this week is 50-50. After finding themselves at both ends of a failed coup attempt, two bickering mercenaries are hired by the CIA to have another go, this time working together with the local rebel leaders. Um, I remember seeing this back when it came out, back in around about 1992, I think it came out. Um, My local video video store and, and... 
so holding it in my hand and it was a case of like 50 50 it's like shall i rent this or shan't i obviously i you know i like peter weller from robocop uh robert hayes you know even though he was in the um the airplane movies other than that he was a bit of a you know um a wild card for me basically but i thought i'd give it a bash and i, I other than the opening which i thought was a bit too jokey um it settled down into a really good sort of caper slash action movie. Uh, I, I thoroughly like this. So, uh, Steve, how do you make this one? I was a bit disappointed, to be fair. Um, I, th- I thought it was a little bit too jokey, mm. if you know what I mean. Like, it does start off ridiculously at the beginning, and then it just kind of carried on. I mean, I don't mind banter you know, in between two protagonists in films and stuff like that, but it just seemed a little bit too forced mm. and a little bit too much. I mean, the action's well done, um, especially, you know, like the coup at the end and stuff like that and the training as well. It, you know what it kind of reminded me of? Like Police Academy, in a way. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, where, the, where, the, where they're training the, yeah. the, lo- the locals up, it, just remind me of Police Academy. Citizens um, on Patrol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. And a, a few tonal things as well. I mean, like the um, the bus bit in the ambush. Yeah, that's quite shocking. Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm sure I've seen that bit before. Um, and I can't our, think where. Well, it probably friend, makes you think of speed. Well, that no, plus th- uh, um, our, our sort of colleagues on Twitter who do the exploding helicopter um, website. That might be it. They, 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 it. they used the clip on, on that um, a couple of months back. Yeah, that, that's, that, yeah. that must be where I've seen it because I'm like, I, I, I know what's going on. I've seen this bit and I just couldn't think where because I don't, <laughs> I've, I've not, I've, this is the first time I've watched it. I've not seen it before. I'll All right. be brutally honest with you. But yeah, it's okay. It's your early 90s middle in action movie that, that also can remind me of um oh what's the dog one men, men of war yeah, men at war exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Men, men of, men with war, more yeah. with more of a a comedy vibe to it you know but it Absolutely. just yeah it's a little bit too silly for me yeah. okay uh rich i'm sure you've seen this before how does it stand up for another viewing yeah I, 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 like you i don't think i'd seen it since around the time it was probably out i mean i've I know I, I I say I say that I I think I probably saw it because I don't actually remember really anything about it. So it could be that I didn't see it and I just think I did. Um, it didn't make much of an impression. But the I was I was there was quite a few things that um, I was taken with. Obviously, it um, the first being it's a Canon Pictures release, yeah. so we get the mm-hmm. lovely Canon logo at the start to set things up, which is great. I think it must have been one of the very last films that Canon put out. Uh, it's also you know, as you've said about the men of war and everything, you know, there were there were so many films around this time that were doing the Americans go into, uh, yeah. you know, whether it's um, America or Asia or, or South America and overthrow a it's dictator the whole kind of story. Thing, yeah, yeah. yeah, the whole Contra rebel, uh, Contra scandal, wasn't it? You know, Dan Quayle yeah. and all that. Because we talked about McBain with Christopher mm-hmm. Walken. Yeah. And I, I was even thinking at the end of this movie, I was like, is that the same location? <laughs> as it, did they look, used in... it did look similar, you know, the, the, the bit of the that, movie... was to be, that was supposed to be uh, South uh, Central America or whatever, and yeah. it, it was actually the Philippines. But and I, yeah. and I was like, did they, they, they shot this one in Malaysia, so I don't think it is. The um, uh, Danger Zone, the Billy Zane, Robert Downey Jr. thing, uh, oh, that came yeah. a bit later, but that kind of did a similar kind of buddy banterish uh, thing. So what for me it was the real pleasure, the real surprise was the chemistry between Robert Hayes and Peter Weller, mm-hmm. uh, the the that the banter and the dialogue. I mean, I know you know uh, you guys one or one or two guys thought it was a bit too much, but I thought it was. I thought no, it was I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I myself. thought the um, I thought it was a snappy script, uh, and they were selling it, and they were going. I mean, this is like over ten years since. Uh, the airplane movies for Robert Hayes. Mm. And like you said, mm. he hasn't made, he, he's not really known for anything else. Uh, and I, 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 although I took, although I do take him as like a, a com, you know, a comedy guy and not really an action hero guy, I thought he actually really sold 
some mm-hmm. of the action stuff that yep. he was doing. You know, I I did kind of believe his character was this kind of was this mercenary, you know, like tri- tricky mercenary kind of character. And him and Peter Weller have just got this fantastic uh, banter. I mean, it reminded it was you know it's like a, this is like a Jack Lemmon Walter Matthau or or Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis or whatever you know that kind of you know <laughs> that kind of situation. You know, these guys they end up in this crazy situation. They're just bickering and joking all the time, uh, mm-hmm. but but it works and. Um, you know they're quite they're quite they're quite cynical um but they, you know like a bit like men of war you know they're these sort of cynical mercenaries who you know end up sort of coming around and maybe we should be you know helping uh, you know uh make a difference kind of thing um charles martin smith is yep. the dire- is the director of the film he's also the co-star mm. as as the cia guy who they talk to now charles martin smith is not really known as an action movie director. I mean, more recently, he does things like um, I think Some it's Christmas like movies. Yeah, yeah, Dolphin, Dolphin, yeah. Do- Do- Dolphin Quest Two or something. It was. Yeah. Oh, and he did uh, his film. Uh, most recent film was uh, a gift from Bob, which was the British Bob the Street Cat Christmas yeah, yeah. set yeah, Christmas, sequel, yeah. which I'm really surprised to see his name attached to that. Um, mm. So yeah, he's he's most well known as an actor in things like American Graffiti. Although I think I remember him most from Herbie Goes Bananas, but He's very he's a very prolific director. He's done all sorts mm. of stuff, and uh, I think he did a I think he did a really good job with this. I mean, yeah. uh, it's 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 quite mm. a, it's got a big scale to it. You know, the, like you said mm. the, about the, the helicopter bus part, that that's one of two helicopter explosions. Actually, there's three helicopter explosion. One of which is off screen. Off screen, yeah. But it's yeah. a big it's a big set piece action scene. Of, you know, there's lots of extras involved. There's lots of big big sequences. Uh, it's yeah, it's the kind again. It's the kind of we keep saying this about a lot of the films that we're we're going back to is we just don't get them of this scale anymore, yeah. you know, of this sort mm. of, of this quality, you know. So I mean, this was probably intended as a cinema release when it was when it was originally made, but it yeah, it, it did go um, direct to video over Damn here. You but, can yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love, it. I love. It. I thought it was really, really good. Mm, I did. Um, so the, Charles Martin Smith, I thought, was really good on this as a sort of sort of shady slash slimy uh, CIA guy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the one I remember, well, obviously he was the accountant in uh, the Untouchables, um, but also he yeah. was uh, he was the other shady slash slimy CIA guy in um, Deep Cover with um, Lawrence Fishburne, his, his sort of breakout movie. Oh, uh, yeah. It's in that as well. Um, there's a really good sort of character beat in this. Uh, there's a thing, you know, the two characters um, have a thing about sort of flipping a coin to decide who's going to take the lead or doing whatever, you know. And at the end of the film, they're sort of arguing over whether or not they should walk away or, you know, try try and stop the bad guy. And he flips the coin, and sort of people where this character calls heads and it comes up tails, but he still goes, "Yeah, you win." Which I just thought was nice, <laughs> nice, nice sort of you know friend, sort of buddy moment, which I thought was pretty cool. Well, he kind of he, he doesn't want to. He, he kind of in his heart, he kind of wants to go with what his friend wants to do. Yeah, but he doesn't want to lose face, so he's confronted at that moment mm. with, okay, I've got, I've got the, I've got, you know, if if I want to, I can say we're going, you know, yeah, and uh, exactly, and, yeah, and he 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 turns around and says, look, I'm going to do what. I'm going to do what you want to do, but he's not—he's not going to say that to him. No, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> he's just going to say, again, "Oh, it, you know, it was just the coin. It was luck." You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, "Oh, darn it! I wish I wasn't going through." <laughs> yeah. But he's, you know, that, but that's the camaraderie that they have. It is, yeah. I mean, and he, and he doesn't—you he, know—you kind of expect him to rub it in his face later on when things start going a bit south, you know. <laughs> but he doesn't. He keeps his mouth shut. So that's cool. Oh, I thought the the part where actually you you know where the the dictator's giving a speech hmm. and he's like. He's like I'm saying something else, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something else over him. I yeah. thought that worked really well, and it reminded me. You know, you get these um, the clips from that film Downfall with mm. uh, Al- oh, Adolf yeah, Hitler, yeah, yeah. and yeah. people dub it over with, "Oh, he's saying this, that, or the other." I was like, "It's just like that," mm. <laughs> but but they're doing it in, like for the crowd. The crowd's going, "Yeah,", <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, "No, no," and he's like shaking his hands and whatever. <laughs> it's very well done. Yeah, it, very well timed. It was, it was a great, a really good action comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is on Amazon Prime. We don't score the uh, the throwbacks, but we certainly recommend you check them out. Uh, as I said, this has been on Prime for about a uh, few weeks now, but definitely check it out. It's, it's not in widescreen, unfortunately, but it is still a nice print. Um, it would have been nice to sort of see it expanded, but there you go. Uh, 
Yeah, that would have been good. Mm. Never mind. Can't have everything. Anyway, that is the end of this week's show. So thank you to Will, Steve, and Rich for joining us this week. Always a pleasure. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, don't forget to check us out on Twitter and Facebook at the DTV Digest. Also check out our uh, sister show, the DTV Digest Short Shots, and its own Twitter page where Rich posts a link to a new short every evening around about nine o'clock. Uh, so please sign up to that. Uh, you won't, will not regret it. Other than that, thank you for listening and tune in next time. Thank you for listening to the DTV Digest. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and tune in again next time.